Okay, so I don't think you are going to get too much out of this presentation anyway, so you know, I think you got more out of that. If you are here for the English, welcome. Uh, I think this is the only, the only session in English at this time slot. Um, and uh, once again, if you've seen the presentation yesterday from Luis, um, I think you'll, you're, good to, you know, you're good to go to a different session. But if you want to see what I have to say, by all means, uh, you, can, you can stay here. So, welcome to this session. Um, and let's thank our, our uh, sponsors and partners. My name is Tibi Kovac. I'm not sure if the picture is, you know, <laughs> shows, me, uh, shows the right me. This is about 10 years ago. Uh, so, of course, <laughs> you know, working in IT has a tendency to make people look older after 10 years. Uh, you find me on Twitter. I'm working for Microsoft. I started to work for Microsoft about two years ago as uh, App Innovation Lead, initially for Sweden, and then I moved to, um, to work for Denmark as of April 1st. And Microsoft is a very interesting company, and one of the things, you know, we already know that we own GitHub. I don't know if that's a, you know, important, has nothing to do with the session, and I'm not here to do anything with, you know, to do, uh, or to, uh, to as, as representative of, Git, of GitHub. I'm here as TB, the private person. I'm a technical guy. I started to work as a developer back in 1994 with Visual C++ 1.5. That makes me very old. You know, when people say 30 years ago, I'm thinking 70s. Actually, 30 years ago is the 90s when I started to do programming. So it is a lot, you know, it isn't, <laughs> it isn't that long ago or it's quite long ago. Depends on how you want to look at it. And then I've been working as a programmer, as a developer for almost all my adult life until two years ago. And I don't know, as a developer, the one thing that I always hated were the marketing people, you know? They have no idea what they're talking about. They have, you know, they come up with strange names. They come up with strange ideas. They do things that do not make any sense for us as developers, and I never understood that. Guess what? Now I'm working in marketing at Microsoft, so I'm the person I used to hate. Hopefully, that won't, this won't be a marketing pitch. Um, and the reason I'm, I actually want to do this session um, was because about two years ago, I was helping a friend that uh, was developing an open source project. We did a um, hack for future, was at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody was trying to find something to help others. And this friend of mine was starting to, look on a, to work on a project where he would enable peer-to-peer -peer communication without any servers in between, and without any accounts, without any, you know, <laughs> without any registration. So if I want to have a, you know, a chat with my mother that was alone at home, the, the one way I could do it was actually just call the, uh, you know, call the server, establish a connection, and that was a peer-to-peer -peer communication after that. So I didn't have to be on the server. But he was doing a very complicated deployment and everything, he wanted to do something, it took for him hours and hours and hours. And I've always, you know, <laughs> prided myself that Azure is very simple to do. Of course, talking about DevOps, you should never, ever, ever, ever do right-click deploy. However, that's what I tried to do. I took his project, I opened it in Visual Studio Code, it was a Node.js project, and I just did right-click deploy to Azure. And to my surprise, it was actually pretty easy to deploy to Azure. And then looking forward into that, I've seen that you can do a continuous integration uh, you know, settings on that. And trying to, to fiddle a little, bit, a little bit with it, and Microsoft says, do you want to use the new thing called GitHub Actions? Like, let's see what that is. And I really liked what I saw. I really liked the way, you know, that was very easy to do. Of course, two years ago, there weren't too many things available for that. So I started to look, how can I work with it? So I really, you know, I'm really here mostly to show you my journey and how I got to work with uh, GitHub Actions. I have a small agenda. Now, this is actually from the GitHub marketing department. And the reason for that, I just asked them, can you give me something that you have already done so I don't have to write the presentation? I can just do the demos. So, you know, demos I can fail myself, but <laughs> at least the presentation, the marketing side, I would let someone else to, uh, to fail on that. So, a short introduction. Then we're going to look at some of the events that will trigger our workflows. We're going to talk about jobs and artifacts, so how you create those, how you work with artifacts um, in GitHub Actions. And then I have some demos uh, about creating an application and starting all the work with GitHub Actions. Then I will show you how we work with secrets and then look a little bit more on workflow side and how you can create your own templates. And then we are going to do a little bit more advanced demo just to see all the things, how they, how they nicely fit together. And I have a slide with resources where you can go and learn some more about it. Now, what's a GitHub Action? 
you get several events happening in your GitHub repository. Some of them can be a push, you know, some of them can be pull requests, some of them can even be issue creations. So you can create an issue, and that should do something, that should create some kind of action. Or you can even create a new release. So once you do that, you want to automate. So one of the pillars of, of good DevOps is that you should automate everything that is possible to automate. So why doing manual thing or manual work when you can automate the things? And what we can do, actually, we can create those workflows where we can combine and configure the actions, you know, and then decide which services do we want to use, how do we want to build, how do we want to work with that. Now, GitHub Actions, it's open source. And uh, there are a lot of actions coming straight from GitHub. There are a lot of actions coming straight from Microsoft. For instance, if you want to work with Azure, there are many of the, of the actions already created. And everything, everything that an action does, it's actually out in the open. You can see the source code. If you want to create your own based on existing one, you can just take that and create your own actions and work with that. Moreover, you can, you can publish your own actions as well. So one of the things that I, I, I found was you know, someone was creating an action to deploy into an Azure storage account. And for me, that was a little bit strange, because the way he did it, he created a .NET application that he would have to compile every single time inside a container whenever he wanted to run the, the action. And the action itself, if you look at what, <laughs> what GitHub recommends, is that you, know, you can use JavaScript, you can use TypeScript. You can actually have a, you get a container with Node.js already installed on it, so why not using this? So what I did actually, I took, I, took the, you know, I took the idea from the guy, and then I started to look a little bit on how I can change that and how I can make it a little bit better. So I ended up having, I would say, 40 lines of code. Not even, I mean, if, I, if you really count the lines that do something, like code-wise, I don't think there are more than 30 lines of code um, necessary to be able to deploy uh, on an Azure storage account. Of course, you have all those error checks and making sure that you know, all the validations that give you more code, but you know, the whole gist, the whole thing of the things that you need to do, it is not longer than 30 lines of code. It's very easy to customize. It's very easy to work with it. It supports any language. Why? Because it runs actually inside a container. And then it's something like, you know, if this, then that kind of uh, solution for DevOps. So that's what GitHub Actions does. We have Azure DevOps as well, and we have the pipelines there and the release pipelines that are going to give you kind of the same, uh, the same solution. Now, the basis of GitHub Actions is actually what is called a workflow. So on workflow, it's triggered by an event, and the event has one or more jobs, and each job has one or more steps. Now, when we look at the jobs, actually, the jobs are either running actions, or they can run scripts, and then they log the results of the things that are happening. And you can have several steps, and each step will run inside this, uh, you know, will run one or more actions. And once you're done with that, you go either to the next job or you finish the workflow. Now, when we talk about um, the triggers, we have different types of triggers, either uh, webhook triggers, uh, trigger events, manual events, or schedule events. So we can use cron tab, for instance, or cron like um, um, timing, where I can say at every, you know, every day at a certain period of time, you can run that, or every month, or every week, or whatever you, you choose for that. Um, you can filter by including branches. You can filter by path. You know, if you want to look at events, for instance, if you say, if I push something in this folder, then I want you to do these kind of things. So it doesn't make any sense to rebuild the whole application if the only thing I've done was changing some tests. So what I'm doing, actually, I'm just running the test because I've updated the test folder. So that could be an idea. Uh, you can even run them manually. So you can choose to have a workflow running manually, and you can even give it parameters. So with parameters, you can, you can choose how you want to run it and what exactly do you want to do. We have some examples, like issues and pull request feedback. You want to set up remainders. You want to have triaging for, for things. You want to configure your repository. Um, you want to do different tasks. You want to work with, with, uh, with project ports. So there are many, many, many type of um, events that uh, are, you know, are going to allow you to trigger those GitHub actions. The other things you can do, actually, you can use webhooks. By using webhooks, it means that, in theory, every single thing that can send a post request to a GitHub repository can actually generate or can uh, kick a um, you know, GitHub action or start, start a GitHub action. 
Jobs, as I mentioned, can either run in parallel or can run sequ uh, in sequence. If you want to run them in sequence, there is, a, um, there is an instruction called needs. So you create a dependency. You say, this job needs this other job. So you can't start running this unless this one, this first is done. For instance, you shouldn't start running, uh, you shouldn't start building your application if you haven't done the restore of the packages. You shouldn't start testing your application if you haven't built that. So you need to do that. If you want to do it job by job, you need to do them sequentially. Uh, you can create a build matrix. With build matrix, actually, you can, you can parameterize those actions and, or those jobs and run them in parallel on several, uh, on several platforms or on, based on several uh, input values. And then those running in parallel, it means that you can save some time while, while you're running those and make it much easier for you to, to decide how you, how you want to move along. One example could be if you want to test your application and you want to build it both for Linux, for Mac OS, and for Windows, you can create a, a matrix with operating systems that you want to choose for that, and then it will run on those, uh, on those combinations. You can add your own containers to run things on, you know, as an action. Again, that makes your life much easier. You just need to make sure that when you work with containers, you trust the content of those containers. If they are your own, then it's not a problem. But if they come from a third party, trust should be, <laughs> should, you know, you should trust that, that repository. And you can actually specify as well where the jobs are executed. You can run them self-hosted, so you point to, a, to your own machine. You can run them on a Linux operating system. You can run them on ARM64 and so on. And ARM64 is very important. I don't know if you've seen, but there, are, there is a lot of work at Microsoft, at least nowadays, that we are trying to enable ARM64 more and more, mainly because of a low consumption in energy. So if you, you know, we are talking about sustainability. So if you really want to be sustainable, ARM64 actually it's one thing that you really want to uh, look into. Now, jobs do not communicate with each other directly. So, and I cannot, you know, I cannot share the data directly between jobs. So what I, want, what I can do instead, once a job is completed, I can actually, as one action, I can upload the results of that job as an artifact. And having them as artifact, it means that I can take them into a different job and then work with them. One thing could be, you know, logging files, or it could be the binary of my compilation. I want to put them somewhere, and then I can use them for deploying the application. I can do, you know, uh, stress testing of my application, and all those output values, I can take them, and I can put them in my, uh, in my cloud coverage uh, uh, reports, so I can see them exactly, you know, I can get a nice-looking um, uh, thing there. So, let's start with the first demo, and... What I want to do, actually, I want to do a, I want to start from scratch. So I would do mkdir. So I'm creating a folder dot net 2022, and then I say dot net new web. So about two months ago, I was running exactly the same demo. I did it from home, and everything would run correctly. And then I did a presentation at a, at a user group in Denmark, and it didn't work. And I had no idea what was wrong. I tried to do the deployment, upload it, just to realize that actually on my machine, I was, I was running .NET 5. And on the machine that I put on Azure, I had .NET 6, and I got the blue screen of death, and I, I never understood why, why was that happening. And of course, as soon as you're done with the whole presentation and you shut down the computer, you realize, ah, that might have been. But I was a little bit too late. <laughs> I, I knew it was working, but I wasn't sure what was missing there, and that, that was not working. So once we're done with that, I can just say a .NET run. Actually, you know, if you want to do it correctly, you would do .NET restore, and then .NET build, and then a .NET run. However, <laughs> they... Let's see, I think it might not do the restore. So I, oh, it looks like it's running, so let's try now. And I have a hello world, as simple as that. So I just created a new .NET application and I was running this uh, and I could, you know, I could deploy it. Um, uh, I could, you know, I could run it locally on my machine. So let's kill this and let's look a little bit at code and how code can help us with this. So, yeah, for some reason it needs to update the server. I think it just updated my, uh, my Visual Studio code, so that's why it needs to update the server. How many of you are using uh, Windows Subsystem for Linux? 
Good. I, I like it. It's very nice. It looks, you know, it, it, I, instead of installing Bash, I just use, uh, I use Windows Subsystem for Linux. And the connection with Windows, it looks very good. So I really like that. Um, so coming back in here, I have my Visual Studio code. I installed Azure extensions. I only have them. Uh, right now, I have only four app services. You can install for every single service that you might want in your application. I can start actually deploying my current, uh, you know, my current project, which is this one, um, you know, which is the .NET 2022 that says "Hello World" as soon as you do a GET. Um, I can choose to build to to publish that directly. However, sometimes I've seen that the, the default region that I get. It's not really, you know, sometimes I have problem with provisioning services. So I know that, for instance, EastOS or EastOS 2 is working. So that's why I, I go a little bit, you know, to the hassle of manually creating an application. So it says, create a new web application. I can do that directly from here, or I can go into Azure portal, and from Azure portal, I can create that one um, in there. Let's see, .NET 2022. The name might be busy. No, it's not. Actually, nobody is using this name. Good. Uh, I can create a new resource group. Um, if you are familiar with Azure, you know, all the resources need to be grouped into a resource group. It's most like a folder. Uh, yes, I'm using RG at the beginning, so it's, it's my name convention. <laughs> Not necessarily, but, the, you know, different people use different name convention. I like to prefix the things because then I know a little bit easier what it's all about. Um, next one, what version do I want? I want .NET 6, long-term support on Linux. And then it asked me, where do I want to put the resources? It says, recently you used that. That was actually about an hour ago, so it was working. Let's hope that it's still working there. It says that I already have a app service plan. If I want to use that, I won't. I create a new one. And again, I'll create it, app service plan, .NET 2022. And then, which, um, you know, how much am I ready to pay for that? It's not me, it's Microsoft that pays for it. But I say I want the premium version. And I will explain a, a, a little bit later why I chose the, the premium version. Normally, I would create an application inside in order to get all the logging and all the, you know, all, the, all the things that are happening with my application. I will skip it for now because I just want the resources to be deployed much quicker. So it does create an app service plan. Uh, it shouldn't take too long. It's just a Linux machine. Normally, it takes about 30 seconds to, to provision the Linux machine. Once this is, or actually, I don't see the Linux machine, but I know it's a Linux machine on the back end that gets provisioned. And once I get that created, it creates the web app. And once the web app is created, I will get a nice question here. Do you want to deploy the application? Because I see that you are inside the web application. So maybe you want to do a deployment out of it. So I will go on that and say, yes, I want you to deploy. The alternative would be then to just go in here, from, you know, like it was showing me earlier, and then say, deploy that. And this will show me a list of, web of the existing web applications that I can deploy to. So one second. Now it's done. Let's see. Show me. It says, do you want to deploy? I say, yes, deploy. What folder is my current .NET 2022 folder? Um, it says, you are missing some configuration. Do you want to add it? Yes, I want to add it. Once I say that, it creates the configuration file. And one other thing that is asking me is like, do you want to always deploy to this application? If I say yes, inside the configuration file, it will say, yes, this is application. It's automatically connected to this web app on Azure. So whenever you, you, know, when it, whenever you choose from Visual Studio Code to do deployment, this is how you do it. However, one of the things that I said is that never, ever, ever do the right-click deploy. So that was only the first thing, just I want to get all the resources created. And instead of doing manually and doing point of clicking in the portal and not remembering what I choose, I do it from here, almost the same kind of thing. Once this is done, I think it will show me in the output window, it will show me uh, where is the, um, you know, where the application got created. And once I have the application, I can go into that one, and then I will show you that I get on Azure something. Uh, yeah, browse to the website. I can go to that particular application and says, this is how it looks. It should be hello world. It should. Yay! If you don't believe me, look, it's here. Hey, <laughs> yeah. A very complicated way of doing you know, a very simple application, but we have it. So next step, that's what I mentioned. It's um, how do we go in and do the you know, do some kind of automation. 
So I have the resource group that was just created. Inside, I have an application service plan, and I have an application. And here, I can go into my deployment center. That's what I did last time. I went in here, and it says, OK, so do you want to deploy the application? And this is something that was, again, came about two years ago. It says, where is the source code? The source code should be somewhere on GitHub. Actually, I haven't done any GitHub. So what I can do now, I can go back in here. Actually, I can go to the GitHub thing, and it says, do you want to publish to GitHub? Let's do that. Um, I want to sign in to GitHub. Um, I don't want to allow that to use any other things. Go back. Hopefully, that will work. I will publish to a public repository called .NET 2022. What do I want to publish? I don't want obj. I don't want bin. Um, VS Code are local settings. I don't need them. Ah, doesn't matter. You, you can just play with it. Um, and then I say publish. And then everything is there. Um, and I just got my repository published here with all the code and all the things that I had. So coming back in here, I can now go back to Azure. Uh, where was it here? To Azure and say, I want to choose the source code, which would be in GitHub. I already configured that to work with my own account. Uh, I will take my own personal organization or my own account as, as an organization for that. And then the repository, it will be, it will be um, .NET 2022. OK, and which branch? We take, we take always the master branch. Come on. And what it says here, now we are going to create a workflow for you. And for me, that was the aha moment. This is wow. This looks very interesting. The one thing I don't like about it, who wants to take a wild guess? YAML. That's the thing. I don't like YAML. I don't know why. It's not a programming language, but it is, you know, it's very, it's, it's used by a lot of people, and you just have to get used to that. And one of the things that I've seen a lot of people having issues with is like, ah, the indentation. Or if you miss a space somewhere, it doesn't work the way it should, and so on. So it says like this. I want you to trigger this either when you push master or workflow dispatch. Workflow dispatch means that I can go into action and say run manually. So it will do exactly the same thing uh, once more. And it says, OK, I want you to build the jobs. I want you to run them on Ubuntu latest. And then one of the things that I need you to do, I need you to set up .NET. So starting from a clean Ubuntu machine, you won't have .NET. So that's why we have an, uh, an action that will, install, uh, will uh, install .NET locally. Which versions I want to do. And if I want to include any of the pre-releases of .NET. Once this is done, what do I want to do? I want to first build that, the release configuration. And then I do a publish using the root of the environment uh, of, the, of that and the uh, application, you know, and I will put that in a folder called my application. Once I'm done with this, I want to upload the artifacts. Remember I said the, one, the only way to communicate, or communicate to send, uh, to pass information between jobs would be to use artifacts. So I'm uploading those artifacts. And the name would be .NET application. And what I'm actually publishing, I'm publishing the content of my app folder. And then the next step would be, so I, this is the first job is to build. The next step would be actually to uh, deploy. So .NET, the, uh, .NET publish is just creating the package. It's not really a deployment. So I'm not deploying yet the application. Now I say, I want to deploy the application. Again, runs on the latest version of Ubuntu. It is dependent on build. So. Once build is done, that's when this one is going to run. And once I'm done with that, I want to use an environment called production. I will come back to it, and I will, I will show you how we use that. I want you to, uh, you know, to uh, publish the URL of the web application by using this. And then the steps that I want to, you know, that I, the steps for this one would be, first of all, download the artifacts from, you know, called the .NET app. Those will be all the files that were on the previous job in the My App folder, and then, I want to deploy to web application. And the way that works, it says, you know what? I want you to use web app deploy. And web app deploy requires you a name of the application and requires a slot. Again, I will come back to this a little bit later. And then it requires a published profile. How many of you have worked with web app deployment? 
Okay, quite a few people. One of the things, if you remember, when it was, we used to call the web role about 12, 13 years ago, you always had a, an XML file that you were using as a publishing profile. That's exactly the same type of file. So we are still using that today. If you only want to deploy the web application, so not giving access to your Azure environment, you can use the publish profile and that will help you with this. And as you see here, it says that this is a secret. So I'll get back to the secrets and I will show you how this one is working. And which package, package dot, it means whatever I downloaded here in the previous step in my current folder. So that's what I'm uploading to my web application. I say close, and once I press save, what it will do, it will create the artifacts inside my GitHub action, inside my GitHub repository, and I will have, let's close this one, uh, and I will have actually this one already connected. So. Those are done, it is connected. If I do now a refresh in here, I will see that I got a GitHub workflows folder. And this one says, yes, we have an action here. This one is called master, the name of the branch, and then it's called .NET 2022. I can even look at the actions. It says that this one is running at the moment, so just because I did deploy it, uh, I deploy it, it all automatically run this and it will deploy my application. So just to test that it works, we can go back in here and instead of hello world, we can actually, let me do this first. I can get the changes because you, I always forget to do that. And then of course you have to do merging and then you've done changes here and there and they're not working correctly and like a lot of complications. So let's get all the changes in here. So what I ended up getting is the GitHub folder with the master file in here. So coming back here to the files, I can just go, no, here. Program CS, and then this one would be dot, uh, no, sorry, dot net 2022. Save. Uh, let's see if this one is done. Although I don't think it would be affected, the only problem would be that it will automatically deploy those over. The nice part here is that it shows, yeah, you have a build step and you have a deploy step. If you remember, I showed you we have here inside the GitHub action. Um, we have here an output that it's a new URL. So this is the thing that we are going to see automatically here. This is the URL that we get. So I can actually click on that and see we get exactly the same result because we deployed exactly the same application. So coming back in here uh, to, my, um, to my code, I can look in here, uh, making major changes. Of course, this is a comment, so we know what we do. Um, and then I can do a push. Of course, in, in a normal situation, you might want to do that on a pull request. You might want to test first and make sure that all the integration things are working. But I'm, I like living on the edge, and I do deployment in production directly. So I'm using my production environment for that. So guess what happens? Because I did a push now to master, if I go back in here, I will see that I have another action that get triggered, it's using the comment here and says making major changes, and then again, it does the build and then it does the, uh, the deployment. Okay, so um, I'll get back and I'll show you that it really worked, you know, so trust me for, for, for the next minute or so until I get back in here. Now I mentioned a little bit of, of you know, the, the, the word secrets. So one of the things that actually uh, uh, you would want to do, you want to make sure that you guardrail the stuff that you need to deploy your application. So one of the things, for instance, what you don't want to, you know, if you use a password for something, or if you use a configure or connection string to work with the database, or I, as in our case, I'm using a uh, uh, deployment profile, then I really want to make sure that the things that I'm actually <laughs> putting in there are guarded. So what, uh, what GitHub Actions offer is something called um, uh, secret. There are three different stores for secret. One of them is at, at, at organization level. So when I'm using a GitHub organization, I can go at the organization level and add a secret that every single repository will get access to. Then I can go inside the repository and create secrets at the repository level. Now, if I have a secret with the same name at the repository level and at the organization level, the repository level will override that. So I will have it, uh, um, you know, I will have it overridden. And then inside the repository, I can create different environments. You've seen, I've shown you already the production environment that I was using for that. I can create a staging server or a staging, staging environment that would use a different set of credentials or different set of secrets that I can put in there. 
Now, whenever you are logging stuff, because they are coming from secrets, GitHub will automatically uh, you know, put star, star, star instead, instead of the, the thing in there. And the decoded values would only be available within the action workflows. Of course, if your action workflow reads the, uh, the secret and it uses it as an environment variable inside it, and then it's printing it somewhere else, then that you can't control. But at least at the, you know, from, from GitHub standpoint, it makes sure that the, the, the secrets are not leaked in any way and you are not going to see them. Now, again, at the organizational level, all the repositories are going to see it both the private and the internal ones, you can even select some repositories that are going to be able to see it. And the reason you might not want to choose the public ones is because <laughs> if some people can add, public, you know, uh, can add public repositories and everyone can change them, that means they, they might be able to get access to the secrets, so that's why you want to keep it private or internal. For the repository and environment, again, the most specific one is going to, to be the one taking precedence, and then you're, you're, you're going to Work with that. Now, when you work with workflows, we have the possibility to create a little bit more advanced workflows, or at least to create a little bit more advanced templates for our workflows. And one of the things that would happen here would be that I want to do the, you know, I want to create something that whenever a new project is created following certain ways, I want to have those workflow templates already created so the, you know, my colleagues can take them already. So they don't have to go from, from start and they don't have to go to, you know, Visual Studio Code, create a project and then go in GitHub, create a project there and then do the, the whole dance in Azure portal and so on. You don't want to do that. You just want to make sure that you have everything done as a template. So you might do the dance the first time, you might make, up, make sure that you get all the things the way you want them, and then once you're done, you can deploy them and, and work with them. So uh, when you create a template, you can put them in the workflow templates folder, so th those would be you know, the, the, the by default ones. When you use the templates, you can create as well parameters or properties for it, so making sure that you can, you know, you can include those values um, in that. There are some problems and some things that we are still working on, or the GitHub engineering team is still working on, and there is, a, you know, there is a roadmap. You can look at it and see exactly what, what they are planning and when they are planning to do it. Actions, you can either create private actions, so you can put them in the, the .github slash actions folder, and that means you have private actions that will only work for you, or you can publish them inside the GitHub Marketplace. So you, care, you create a release of your action, and once you create a release, a release, you can choose to publish it over there. The other thing that you can do, you can version it as well. So if I want to make sure that I'm using the right, you know, the, the version that I know how it works with the right parameters, I can just add uh, an at sign at the end of the name and then the version that I want to use for that particular, um, for that particular action. So, Using environments, I can do continuous delivery, and that may, you know, I can actually create my, uh, uh, create my container-based application, I can do it in, the, in multiple environments, I can do it in, in multiple um, uh, clouds, I can use, uh, the, you, you know, the GitHub built-in uh, container registry, uh, I can use the, you know, I can make sure that I can get gated, um, gated deployments as well, so I can ask actually for reviews and for the things that I want to do. So, let me go back to my demo. The first thing I think we want to see is if this one worked. Yay! So we did. I told you to trust me. I know it was a little bit more than one minute. Sorry for you know, holding so long on, on that. Yes, thank you. Uh, so 10 more minutes. So let's see how much do I manage to do in 10 minutes. So the next thing I want to do, I want, you know, so uh, I know living on the edge was, was, the, you know, was the dream of my life and I want to do that. But sometimes I have colleagues that they really don't like this way of living. So what I can do is that I can use what, um, what the web apps offer, which is called a blue-green deployment. I can use that by using the notion of deployment slots. The nice part of a deployment slot is that it is a web application running side by side with my original application or with my production application inside the same uh, machines. So they are using the same resources. They are competing on the same resources. But it has a very, very interesting feature. And that feature is actually the fact that I can swap uh, environments. And by swapping, environment, or swapping slots, by doing that, I have almost zero downtime 
on my application. And I can do stuff like warm ups, so I can say, you know what, I want you to deploy on the staging, and then once you deploy on the staging, I want you to try to, you know, to do some get on the application. And as soon as you get that, you know, I want you to automatically swap those two, you know, from this environment, from, from this slot to this other slot. So you can do auto swapping as, lot, as well. How do I add a slot? One way would be by hand here. The name would be staging. Of course, I had a lot of uh, settings in my original application. Actually, none, because it's a simple Hello World application. But I can choose to copy the settings, so I don't have to go to the same thing. If it's a staging environment, I might actually choose to have a different database, have different things in, in there, just to make sure that we are not overriding those kind of things. And what it's end up doing, actually, is creating a new application called .NET 2022 dash and the name of the, uh, the slot that I was just creating. So in my case, it would be dash staging. And I say add, and this will add a new web application. That would be empty to begin with. So what I want to do now, I want to make sure that I want to, you know, I, I, I can deploy to this, uh, to this staging environment. So how do we do that? We go back in here. We have the action. And... Actually, the, the simplest way to do that would be to do staging. To do the staging in here. Now, this is not really, you know, it's not really going to work. And for that, the reason for that, it's a little bit, um, you know, it's a little bit different. It's because um, having a new application, it means I have a completely new deployment profile. So I need to actually replace the, the, the secret or create a new one for this publishing profile. So let me do this, actually, and create a new... Um, a new job. The first one would be called deploy to staging. It needs build, so I can't do that without the other. The environment that I go, I'm going to use would be called staging. Um, I use code pilot if you realize, and it just showed me that, oh, you might want to call this staging. I think, you know, it looked at the stuff that I've done before, and that's why it's, it, you know, it's looking into that. I don't need to change the, uh, the output here. It's the same thing. I'm actually doing the, uh, I'm, I'm still copying the same artifact. Um, and I'm doing a deployment to the staging environment. The only thing I'll need to do is just to create a new secret here to do the published profile. So let's do like this. I will, call, I will copy this one. And I can go back now to the, this. I can look into .NET 2022. And I have some settings, and one of the settings I have in here is secrets. And it's an action secret that I'm going to use. I already have one. This is a repository secret. I can create now a, an environment secret, but in order for me to do that, I need to first create an environment, of course. So I'll do a new environment. The name, let's make sure that I'm using the right name, because usually I'm crappy at spelling. So copy and paste will make sure that I'm propagating the error everywhere. Um, so, staging, configure environment, um, and that's it. No protection rules. However, now talking about protection rules, one of the things that, that I really want to do in production, I don't want to just do the deployment as it is. I want to do a required review. So someone needs to look first here, you know, before, they, before I allow that to happen, uh, to, to move on. So I would say, I will be the reviewer, you know. And then I will save this protection rule for production environment. So I have the environment. Now going back in here, um, I look at the secrets and I create an action secret. And I want to create an, uh, an action for um, environment. So the environment I want to use, it's staging. Oh, it takes me back. And the secret here is this one. Let me go back. I was copying this name from here. and put it in here. And then I need a published profile. So the way I get the published profile, I'm going back to my Azure portal. And inside Azure portal, I can take my uh, deployment slot, uh, close here. I can look at this. This is another web application. And what I have in here, it should come up here, uh, get published profile. And this is an XML file, as I mentioned earlier. Um, Okay, and put it in the 
value here. And that's it. I got now the environment secret and it's called app service publish profile. So going back in here to my Visual Studio code, I can change the secret name to this one and save it, okay? Now, I do that in staging. This would be called then deploy to production. Of course, you know, uh, code for the win. And what I need here, it's actually deploy to staging. So I don't want to do, uh, or was it called stage or staging? Staging. Uh, you see, not that smart all the time, so yes. I still need it as a developer, so that's good to know. Deploy sta to staging, saving this, and that's it. So what I can do now, I can go in here, uh, mod modifying, actually, let me do one more change, because I want to show you that, you know, we can do a lot of things. Hello.net, now with staging. Okay, so save. I know I should have had two different commits, but you know, you know what I'm doing here, so let's do that. Um, two commits in one. And then saving, sync changes. And once I'm doing that, it will automatically kick, start the action again. So we can go back now to actions, and if I haven't forgotten anything, then we should, we should have three steps now. If I wouldn't have added the, uh, the needs, uh, you know, deploy, uh, deploy to staging, then those two would have been here in parallel. This one would have been already, you know, with the, uh, would have been with the, with the circle here. Once the build would have been done, the build to the staging would have been kicked, um, uh, kicked on, and then deploy to production would have been the one, you know, um, next here and saying you need first to review and accept this change. So let me show you this, how it works. And then one of the things that, you know, um, doesn't really work or doesn't really do justice here is because what happens now, I get it in staging, I get to see it, how it looks in staging, but my deployment to production, what it does actually, it just goes in and, uh, you know, and, and move the things. So. It says here, this one is waiting for a reviewer. I need to review the deployment. So in order for me to be able to review, let's look at the application and see that it's working. So now what it says, it says, yes, you have now, hello, now it's staging. The normal way to do it now, if you want to do a blue-green deployment, is you go here and you say swap. And once you say swap here, it actually automatically offers you, you know, from two. It says, oh, I only see that you have two slots in here. Depending on what I chose at the beginning, because I chose the P1 V2, which means premium um, web application, I have up to 20 slots. If I would have chosen standard, I have up to five slots. Five might be enough. So, you know, depending on what you, what you need in your application. And if I say swap, in about 30 seconds, we are going to see that my Original application would say hello.net 2022. Now it's staging. Staging would say hello 2022. Uh, hello.net 2022. Still working on it. Um, come on. Working on it. Try again. Come on. So once this is done, I have swapped those. Now there is another hidden advantage here, and that's actually the fact that if something is wrong with my, you know, with, with, with my staging now that I put in production, I can always go back and do a swap back, and then I will get back my production environment exactly as it looked before I did the, the swapping. Come on. Ta-da! And now this one should, ta-da. So both of them are working. Thank you. <laughs> um, and of course, going back here now, I can do a review on the deployment. And I said, yes, actually, I'm ready to deploy to production. Now, this is stupid because what it does is actually copying exactly the same application over the existing application because I already moved staging to production. So it doesn't, it doesn't add anything to it. So let me close this. 
One thing I want to show you more, uh, one more thing, because I, I, it will take a little bit more than, than we have here. I've done that at a previous conference. One other step I can do, instead of deploying to production uh, to, do, you know, to, uh, to do the deployment last, like a web application deploy, my, I can add a new step called swap. So what swap does actually, it looks at what I'm having in my, uh, you know, like it, it actually logs in into my Azure. It needs something called a Azure credential, so I would need to create those, you know, to create the Azure credentials using AZ, AD, uh, create for RBAC uh, kind of uh, uh, command, or I can manually go in into the portal and create a new, a new application credential. And with that one, I need to manually run an AZ web app deployment slot swap, and then what's the name of the application, which resource group the application exists in, and what's the source, um, what's the source slot, and of course I can add the, the staging slot. Now, one thing that I, I need to do as well, it's to make sure that I get the URL, and in order for me to get the web application URL, I would have to actually manually read that once I get this, because I wanna show it here as an output from my, uh, from my steps, so those, those are the things. Um, I will do this, I will add this step in, into the, uh, you know, into the uh, original file here. I won't run it because it does exactly what I did by clicking over there. Um, I can do here, I can add this in here. The name should be changed to um, dot, uh, net 2022 the resource group is .net, .net 2022 and the same here, name and group .net 2022, okay? And I would need to add a new secret with the Azure credentials in order to have that working, but otherwise this is, uh, you know, this is how it should look, okay? So saving this, Publishing it, so you can commit it and publishing it. Actually, one more thing I can do here, just to make it if false. So I don't want that deployed to production to run anymore because I'm doing swapping, isn't it? So it, again, it will defeat the, the whole the whole purpose of it if I if I do this. So if false, it keeps everything, but it's not running it because it's uh, uh, it's not working. It's not. Uh, you know, it, it's ignoring this. This is a condition that I can use differently. And then I would say adding swap. Okay, and I got uh, the big uh, big red sign saying in time, time's up. That means we're up for questions. Yeah, any questions? I don't see, okay. Yes. Uh, yes, we were wondering in the swap step when you put the credentials, uh, what happens if you have multi-factor authentication? How you, so, um, <laughs> you are not using any user credentials. So what, what I'm actually doing, if I, I can show you exactly how you create the credentials, because you go in here, like in a, you can go into Azure CLI. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, okay, sorry, yeah. The question was, um, what happened if you have multi-factor authentication for the user? This is actually not the user that I'm using, it's a service principle. So that's why I'm creating a service principle uh, with AZ, AD, create for RBAC. Uh, so this is the, the command that, I, that you are actually using, and it shows you uh, what, what you need to, to run uh, something it's misspelled, but yeah, so there is, you just look for, you know, Google it and you will find, or I, I think it's Azure AD SP create for our back. So it's a service principle that you are creating. In other words, you are not going to need, uh, you are not going to need any, any of the, uh, any, uh, or multi-factor authentication, it's not, it's not in there. Other questions? If not, okay. Uh, come up front if you have more questions and you don't want to ask them like this in, in, yeah, in live sending. Thank you, and yeah, have a nice conference.